I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole meeting to order for April 13th, 2022. I'll call a roll. Council members Dixon? Here. Good? Here. Martinez? Here. Powell? Here. Rauschenberger? Here. Shaw? Here. Stefan? <clears throat> Thorne? Here. Mayor Captain? The absence of Mayor Captain, I'll take a motion for Mayor Pro Tem. I will um, move to appoint um, Councilperson Chish Powell to preside over our meeting. Um, Second. Today. Any discussion? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberg? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Motion carries. <laughs> All right, next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of March 23rd, 2022. Move so for approval. Second. second. Motion is made and seconded. Any corrections or additions? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Steph Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Council member Powell? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda. Oh, sorry, that passed 9 0. Next item on the agenda is uh, special presentations and reports. Um, that's for the regular meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I was trying to do a Pledge of Allegiance. I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> special presentations and reports. Um, the first item this evening is um, Special Events Coordinator Kate O'Leary. She's going to be providing updated information relating to the alcohol vendor proposals that would have been submitted to the city since her last discussion with the City Council and the public upon whether the city should be conducting the Nightmare on Chicago Street event this fall. Welcome back, Ms. O'Leary. How thank are you? you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, when we last spoke, I had presented the special event season for 2022 which had included the Nightmare in Chicago Street event that takes place in October. We had discussed several key factors that would impact the planning and execution of Nightmare on Chicago Street, and we were waiting on the last pieces of information to make a final recommendation, which I have for you now. We received more responses to the Downtown Neighborhood Association survey, bringing the total to 51 responses. Of these, 30 businesses are food, drink, retail, or customer service-based businesses that, directly impacted by, or that are directly impacted by the event. Of those businesses, uh, nine would be closed or are unsure of their statuses at this time, while 21 businesses would be open in some capacity on the night of the event. The request for proposals for gate and ticket operations and beer vending services closed on March 25th. We had one response for the gate ticket operations and two responses for the beer vending services. The vendor for gate and ticket operations is a returning vendor who has been involved in Nightmare on Chicago Street since, 29, I'm sorry, since 2018. The beer vendor responses were from two downtown Elgin businesses. Neither business has specific festival event experience of this magnitude, but both businesses have employees or partner companies that have participated in festivals in the past. City staff also reached out to an outside beer vendor that does have festival experience for an estimate of what it would cost to outsource the beer vending for this event. While final numbers would need to be determined, cost to the city is estimated at $35,000 to $40,000, with a possible return of $70,000 to $80,000. This would help the city recoup some costs in the amount of about $35,000. While going with an outside vendor would remove the responsibility from a downtown Elgin business, beer sales at Nightmare on Chicago Street is one variable that would need to go smoothly to contribute to the uh, success of the event, and both businesses who did submit a proposal would still be eligible to sell liquor at the event from an outdoor booth. With this new information, as well as the obstacles that were introduced at the March 23rd Council meeting, my professional recommendation would be to postpone Nightmare on Chicago Street for the 2022 year and rely on results of the upcoming market study to direct the special events path for 2023. Staff would then begin planning the planning process at the end of 2022 and start booking vendors and making preparations in January and February of 2023. At an estimated cost of $512,000, the risk of this event is too great to justify. With notoriously unpredictable weather in October, 
which is an enormous factor in event attendance, along with the unpredictability of a future COVID-19 spike that could potentially require us to cancel the event entirely, the likelihood of the city recouping a majority of the expense is low. To my knowledge, no single event in the history of my department has cost a half a million dollars, and the possibility must be considered that this event could be a total loss. Furthermore, the expectation of Nightmare on Chicago Street is such that any shortcomings would sacrifice the quality and tarnish the brand that has been nine years in the making. The rising material costs, supply chain disruption, labor and volunteer shortage, and difficulty in securing rentals are further issues that hinder the effort in creating the production that is Nightmare on Chicago Street. However, if council wishes to move forward with Nightmare on Chicago Street at the estimated cost of $512,000, staff and volunteers will work to create an event experience that reflects the creative spirit and passion that event goers have come to expect. This event is well loved by the artists who stand behind it, and I have no doubt in my mind that the teams of people who are responsible for making it what it is will do their utmost to carry it to fruition. There are many benefits to hosting this event, but the elements that are outside of our control that all have to go perfectly in order for this to be a success are numerous. Ultimately, the driving factor behind this recommendation is the level of risk associated with the cost and success of this event and what level of risk the council is comfortable with. At this time, I would ask you to consider the options and please direct myself and staff with your decision regarding Nightmare on Chicago Street. Discussion from the council. Councilman Good. Thank you for the update. Um, I guess there was something I've you know, been processing all this information over the past, I guess, month or so. Um, one thing that I'm interested in is I know in past years, um, volunteer base was generated by a, a downtown business. Um, so if you could just refresh my memory, what was the cost? Because I believe that's not gonna be uh, a factor this year. If it were to go forward, we would have to hire out that crew. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, so what the cost of the volunteer uh, well, I, I budgeted in that $512,000, there's several different areas that we require volunteers. A lot of it comes from the pre, uh, before the event even gets on the street. It's all of the building. Um, it's the actor commitments that we get from um, street theater that, that goes through Judy Brownfield. Um, it's it's uh, all of the marketing that we kind of get pushed out. A lot of it comes through the special events department, but we rely on a lot of on our, a lot on our partners to get the word out and, and sh share the news and keep people updated. Um, and then there's the event day preparation where we have uh, different volunteers come in that help set up the props or uh, move the barricades, get, get things that aren't necessarily, like, I don't wanna say skilled labor because every labor is a skill, but mm -hmm. the props that Fred puts together very specifically starting now requires a lot of volunteer and a lot of time commitment versus the people that are coming in kind of at the, uh, in the month of October or the week of October that that all goes up. So a lot of that budget that is set aside for uh, the volunteers that we would be re replacing is for the people that would be starting now to get the event off the ground. Okay, the, what I'm trying to determine is um, this value that was added from the previous business who had taken uh, that under their, I guess their responsibilities. Um, you know, I know this year the expenses are much higher, but I'm also trying to determine uh, what that value was that was being brought by an organization because we know you know nice. momentum is not the same as it was yeah. um, and volunteers is probably the hardest area to regain that momentum yeah. so my concern if this were to go forward is that this cost this year doesn't become the new norm um, but that we're determining the value of that volunteer base that was in existence and so you know again if we were to go forward with it mm -hmm. that we're laying it out that hey this is you know special circumstances the expectation going forward though is that we want that volunteer base to start being, you know, brought back up to the levels mm -hmm. in which it was before. So you, you, you don't have a sense of the dollar amount of that value that's I being brought. I believe I can tell you from 2019, the the man hours that went in on a volunteer basis was easily $100,000 when we calculated all the hours starting from when we began um, planning in March or April all the way up into the event. It was it was over $100,000 of of value okay. that we got from volunteer work. Okay. Yeah. So so theoretically, if, if we were to start rebuilding that. We could look at this down the road, say next year, and it would be a decreased number. That well, it, possibly, yeah. It, it, the, the, you know, the commitment that we get from volunteers, everyone, uh, we appreciate it so much. But circumstances change on such a, a quick basis that the people who are committing now, their circumstances change in October, and so mm -hmm. having a, a, paid. Uh, aspect where they are committing and they're saying I'm going to be there and they they will show up because there's a monetary value attached to it um, it puts a little bit more security on the event versus the people who are are 
would want, want to do it, love to do it, love to paint, love to build, um, but just have a few more obstacles that pop up that they're not expecting. So it's something we would need to consider if we're going to continue, if this, if this is the way we move forward and this is the model that we follow, that we're securing labor at this cost. Is this the model that we're going to go with or are we going to try and rely on the volunteers again moving forward? Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion from the council? Councilman Thor. Thank you. Um, I don't know what to call you tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Queen Tish would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my next comment. Um, thank you, Kate, for the update. Uh, I was a little surprised at your recommendation. However, uh, I've had a very surprising two weeks since our last meeting. And I've had about over 50 people reach out to me asking me not to vote for it, and only five that wanted it out of all the people I know that went out of their way to just reach out. And of course, the, the five were right away, and I was defending it, and then I've been listening to people over and over and over since with many of these situations that you brought up. And one of them is, of course, even with the study that you brought up two weeks ago, is the fact that we're going to raise the gate price. And that's an unknown how that would be accepted, although everything costs more, but people have less. I just want to compliment you on your due diligence and the fact that you're looking at this wholeheartedly for the city, because I know you love it, and I know you really like doing it. But your recommendation is... Uh, obviously shows your commitment to all of us. And I compliment you on that. Um, I'll listen to a few other comrades, but uh, that's the route that I'll be leaning for looking at 2023. Thank you. Any Thank other you. comments? Councilman Dixon. Thank you, Queen Tish. Um, I would say, uh, Thank you for the for coming back in and, and making the presentation. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'm begrudgingly going to accept your recommendation um, because you know when we discussed this um, at the last meeting, um, I was concerned about the the cost, uh, but I do want this. I did want this event to happen, and I still do want this event to happen. But it looks like it's not going to happen. Uh, but um, I think the reasoning and why it's not going to happen is very sound um, uh, and it's um, just overall very reasonable. So I appreciate the time that you put back into it after the conversation that we had to get some additional information. Thank you to DNA for providing some of that additional uh, info. Um, thank you to the volunteers who um, who are here and people who have worked on the event that will, were willing to come back and do this again this year. Um, and so thinking about this event next year, um, just out of curiosity, um, before we even get to that point and just totally dismiss doing anything for Halloween, um, have you and your team um, and volunteers discussed maybe doing some micro events that would not add up, nearly add up to what the proposed cost of the of this event would be? Yes. Yeah, we've, we've had some conversations on, because uh, a gap will be felt. This is, October is kind of our, our month. And so whether that is uh, smaller events or whether that's just a way to, um, I don't know if there's a, a grant opportunities or something that we can do to work with the DNA and, and take what the core of the Nightmare Chicago Street event started with, which was revitalizing downtown and making sure that they're still feeling the benefits of that in some way in October. I don't have details on what that would be yet, but we have had conversations of, of what the fall season is going to look like. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be a great idea to explore and maybe partnering with some of those um, restaurants and or bars that were saying that they weren't going to be able to participate due to staffing. Mm -hmm. This might be an opportunity to kind of, you know, reel them in and get them into the wheelhouse of, of this event and prepare them for, for next year possibly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, uh, so I, I definitely would support that and everything else that you want to do with the event. So thank you again for your time, thank Kate. You. Councilman Rauschenberger. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. O'Leary, for your um, report back. Um, I'm disappointed that uh, the, the city isn't considering it for this year. Um, and I, I feel as though if there's not really enthusiasm by the staff, it's, it's better not to do it. Um, but I would like to definitely consider um, rethinking it for a year from now, supporting um, and making sure the community knows we're considering it for a year, or do you think that, um, I, I mean, I hate to put, you know, six or seven or eight years that we've built a reputation for this um, on the back burner and to do something different. I mean, I don't know if that's part of the thinking of the, um, your organization or your department. And um, so uh, maybe, maybe that's why you're waiting for the report to be done this year. Is there a consideration for that? Yeah, so a, a lot of what what we're doing now is kind of putting the building blocks in place for what is um, what's coming down the pipeline. And so leaning heavily on this market study is is the plan this year because as you've mentioned, there's there's so many voices in Elgin, and we, we do need to make sure that we're hearing from as many as possible. I can't say everyone because it's really hard to reach everybody, um, but we get vocal support for and against, and and that's great. But to really narrow down um, what type of programming Elgin needs to become known for, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to take this year as like a as a building block and get them as much response as possible. Is it nightmare full force next year? Or are we looking at more family friendly events? Is it more neighborhood type events? It's it's so up in the air right now because we do have a good mix at the moment. Um, we just need to, like I said, hone in on what is successful, what isn't successful, and, and hear from as many residents as possible through this market study. Okay, well, again, I, I just uh, take, you know, don't throw away how many years is it that you've, we've had um, national recognition for this event. I think it could be made family fam friendly by extending it a day one way or the other, one, you know, Friday or Sunday. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of tried and true and built. So I, I just want you to take that in consideration. Um, and I do think, I suppose, a logical reason not to do it this year is that we still don't know what the pandemic will look like. And uh, so we wouldn't want 35,000 people in too close. So I, I guess for that reason, I'll wait for a year. But thank you for your information. and. Uh, the thought process. City Manager Kozel wanted to comment. Council, I just, I'm, I'm gonna speak for Ms. O'Leary. The, the, the decision to not recommend going forward has nothing to do with lack of staff enthusiasm. In fact, this is a very difficult decision. As you heard from Ms. O'Leary, if the direction was to go forward, in it 110%, no differently than any other years. It's those multitude of variables that create low barriers to a decision to just stay home if the weather isn't good, if the $30 ticket price is too right. That in conjunction with the highest cost that we've ever seen, we see risk in doing that. But there is no intent to walk away from Nightmare on Chicago Street. The intent is to continue going ahead and ensuring that the product that we've developed over the next nine years continues with that same sterling reputation. And that's what the plan is with the market study and the additional work we'll be conducting this year. But we had those same risks. We had the same risks in the past. So they're not new risks. I think the biggest risk is the pandemic as well. Um, and the cost, again, there's a wait to nine years of an event that So those are the things I just want everyone to be aware of. Any other comments from the council? Councilman Good. Um, so I guess I, I kind of had a, a different experience. I, I think I started last meeting, um, you know, laying out my experience working in food service, um, you know, and my big concern was that the operators in the downtown are largely new um, in this space and they, they, a lot of them weren't around when Nightmare was, was here. Um, so my big concern was that that experience wouldn't live up to the production side of it. Um, and that's just, just a perspective. It's not like that's what I'm putting my money on. Um, 
since then, I've talked to a lot of people, and I know that I live in the downtown, so I have a bias. Pretty much everybody I come across is like, we want it, we want it, we want it, we want it. Um, so I guess before I get into a little bit more, one specific question I do have is for the event insurance, um, what does that look like in the case of a cancellation, whether it be, A, would it cover uh, weather and pan pandemic related? Um, protocol. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the way I understand it, when speaking to Kelly Wazalewski, is that we can't we can't ha get an actual quote for an insurance policy for this type of event until two months out from the event. So, I took the information that we got from the 2019 policy, which unfortunately did not cover. I mean, we didn't have a pandemic, which is great, but they didn't have any pandemic language in there. Um, the weather coverage is for a very specific amount of time. The policy that we got in 2019 was for 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, it costs about. $5,500 roughly for um, certain metrics to be met. So as long as there was an inch or more of rain in that four hour period or 45 mile per hour winds in that window, that was what would cover the event um, for up to, I believe, uh, for $260,000 was the coverage there. Um, if we had gone with the $528,000 policy, it was $10,000 800, I'm sorry, $10,810 to get that same amount of coverage um, for that amount of money. Thank you. Um, and so I guess some of the information that I obtained um, that gave me new perspective is, was provided for some of the folks in the audience. Um, so I don't know if DNA, if you had any new information that would, uh, okay. And uh, if it's not necessary, then that's fine. I, we, all, we all got the results that um, you provided from the additional responses. Um, I guess I, all I want to say is that, you know, the momentum is a concern, um, that this event generated a lot of momentum, and when you look around to other communities, they're having large-scale events. Um, some of the information that was provided to me today was from people who are in that industry. Um, I know food service. I don't know events. Um, but they're busy. They're back up to the levels that they were. Um, so I guess that's something that's, uh, for us to be aware of is that I know we're looking at this with cautious eyes, and, and I think that's a wise thing to do because this is you know, the public's money. Um, but we're getting information from people who are in the downtown saying that they want it. We've got the production committee saying that they're ready to go, that they want to do it. And we were already looking at, we we're going to be losing a good chunk of money. That, that's what we were estimating. Um, but we do have this, I guess, rare out if the insurance criteria was met. Um, and I personally would be willing to take that gamble because of the folks who made this event possible um, and had put this on the map. Because again, it, it, we look at the number of what it's gonna cost and what we'll get in return from ticket sales, but the velocity of money that flies through the downtown on that night and leading up to it uh, is much more significant than what we can capture and present to council. So um, I just wanted to, I guess, provide that perspective to everybody up here. Um, it's not a great uh, set of variables we're looking at, but we all are also looking at the signature event of Elgin, and uh, it, it, I guess my bias being in the downtown, um, I would be sad to not see it happen. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, all I have to say on that, unless anybody from the audience, I'd welcome, welcome you up if you wanted to share some of your compelling information that you share with me. Are there any more comments from the council? Any comments from the audience? If you come to the dais, please. I know we don't normally do this during cow meeting, but. Sign in or anything. But thank you for listening to us. Um, you know, introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Alice Maureen. I've been on board with this event since it was created. I've done the social media for this event and read every post from every person who's ever gone. And if you don't believe that this is worth doing, um, I've lived here all my life too. <laughs> Our reputation since this event has changed. People hear about Elgin and they don't ask if it's scary to live here. They talk about Nightmare on Chicago Street. And people who watch Sven Gulli, who are big horror fans, every Saturday night, not every Saturday night, but many, probably about once a month, he'll sh show a clip. And across the country, any of these Halloween horror fan people hear about Elgin. And we've had people that are on the committee who go to Chicago 
and say they're from Elgin, they go, is that where that zombie thing is? So beyond how much money we're gonna make, whether the pandemic is still happening, um, how many people, how many people reached here? out to any particular one of you with an opinion, I've read every comment for nine years from this event, and if you don't think it's worthwhile, I disagree. So I'm Elizabeth Haney. Um, I work at Acme Design. Um, Can you like speak into the I, I, My name is Elizabeth Haney. I work at Acme Design. Um, I've been on this since the beginning, too. Um, we, um, I, we both live and work in Elgin. Um, and like Alice, I have read all those comments, and um, I have experienced traveling and hearing people being at conventions and things. I had, um, I, I recently applied for a professional tag for trade show things and the man telephoned me to personally tell me that it was approved but also because he's a huge Spanguli fan and he recognized Elgin and he, he was in uh, New Orleans for this professional organization. Um, People all over the country are seeing our city and thinking how beautiful and how fun and how cool and how wonderful it is. And there's a lot of goodwill to be had there. Also though, professionally, ACME does a lot of work with trade shows and experiential marketing events and um, corporate events and things where we're creating props and things that go displays for these events. And overwhelmingly, the evidence is that there is a drive for people to return to in-person events. I too came here tonight wearing a mask. I am very, 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 very careful and I am uncomfortable still being in crowds and I completely agree that this is an unknown time. But the American Association of Osteopathic Surgeons just had a convention at McCormick Place. So if the American Association of Osteopathic Surgeons, which are pretty high ranking doctors, feel safe enough to gather at McCormick Place indoors at a convention, I think we can safely figure how to get a couple thousand people into the streets of downtown Elgin. It's a, it's a committee that is capable of taking into factors. We take people's safety very, very seriously in our committee. We have, that is something that we discuss every year, especially with the world changing the way it is. And um, it is something that we will take very, very seriously with COVID. There is no magic eight ball right now, but there isn't for all of these businesses that are rebooting their trade shows and their professional events and allowing people to travel again and calling people back to the offices. So this economy has to get back on the tracks. And one of the way that we're gonna do that is together. And um, I, I do feel it is really important that, that we get live events back together. And maybe the first time you do it, I go to trade shows now and maybe they're not as well attended, but we keep having them because they are a proven effective tool. And like people want to be together in groups. So they want to be together, they've been separate. So it, I do believe we can do it safely and um, we can bring value to the city. Thank you. Councilwoman Rauschenberger. Uh, yeah, can I ask uh, um, how many people are on your committee, your, you know, ongoing committee? Oh, no, hey, numbers. Do we have a number? <laughs> oh. It's like about a dozen. Our core, our core committee it's is about, about a dozen? dozen people. Okay. And the bulk of them have been on it since, since the first crazy day where we said we have six weeks I, to do this. I know. Um, so, and, and would you say the majority of your committee is a, a go for it? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Councilman Thorne. Thank you, Tish. Thank you, ladies, for your uh, opinion and your talk. Uh, but it does, it resonates with me the fact that I happen to know that Elizabeth works at Acme Design and Acme Design made Sven Gulli's coffin. It can't help but uh, bring a little partiality there, favoritism. Uh, you believe in it because you like it. I love it. I love the, the nightmare. But I'm looking at the half a million dollar expense with so many unknown factors and that that money comes from all the residents of this town, not just the downtown people that are 
younger in age and want it, but all the people that pay taxes that live all across this whole city. And that's where, that's what's swaying me and my concern. And that's why I applaud your recommendation because of these unknown factors that even without all these 100,000 in volunteers that's not there and an added charge at the gate uh, and non-experienced beer vendors, I just think there's too many variables that aren't in the positive means. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Martinez. Thank you. Um, I want to believe, I really think in our heart, we all want to have it. We do. But um, we have to look at the big picture. A lot of contracts that would probably be happening, they should have happened back like in January, okay? And I think because of the reasons that you gave that people want this and you hear it from all over, I don't want to ruin that reputation and trying to put it through. And you know, um, somebody here said it's a pandemic, we don't know, you know? So um, I, I, I get it. I think that this is one of our um, biggest uh, exposures that we have to our city, to our wonderful city. But I think we um, owe it to the rest of Elgin who will be paying for this. And uh, I, I don't think we should risk it, but that's me saying. But do I want it? Definitely. But I don't think it's a feasible thing to do, a reasonable. Um, it would be very difficult. I, I, I think that, you know, we've never had to bring up the price that it's going to be. This is the first time. And then I don't want to shortchange anybody. So uh, that's how I feel. Thank you. Councilman Dixon. Thank you. Um, tell me under, understand this. So you lead the committee the, of the dozen people, correct? I, I, I mean, unfortunately, I, I am not with it since its infancy. Um, I rely on them a lot for where it started and where we're at now. But yes, as the city representative in the committee, I, I okay. am at the top of as far as what gets right. delegated. Okay. And so did the committee um, recommend to you to go forward and but the city just recommended differently? Is that how this? So the committee, largely positive. There was There's uh, one member of the committee that is pulling back that, that uh, agrees with the recommendation to hold off for a year. Um, he's very fiscally minded, and so that's that's kind of anticipated um, that he he's recommending to go uh, hold off. Um, the the love that the committee has for this event is so deep and so uh, apparent, and it is, I, like I said, I have if I had ten Freds and I had ten Elizabeths and ten Alices, um, that this, this would be a uh, it'd be a piece of cake, um, <laughs> pandemic aside and cost aside. Um, so my my concern with moving forward is not with the committee or with their abilities in any way. It's just simply the cost of the event that has increased so much and the uncertain factors. And weather is always a concern, but when the event is usually three hundred thousand dollars, the the loss is much smaller usually that we're risking versus you know, a potential $200,000 loss if we manage to sell the amount of tickets we're hoping to sell. Um, so it's, it's, it is, as you mentioned, Councilman Martinez, Councilman Martinez, that it is a passion. Um, and it is, I cannot overstate how loved it is. It's just, is this the year for it is the question. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that there would be any shortage of people at the event. And that's not really, that's not a factor to me. It, it probably would actually be one of the most well attended events because I think people are ready to get out and are ready to congregate. So that's not really a factor in, uh, in all of this to me. It's more pointing at the things that you pointed out being, you know, COVID and, and then the weather and having spent that type of money and then whether be a factor and you know all of that kind of stuff so i totally un totally understand that so um i mean i, I mean again i say to everyone i absolutely w w want this to happen um but if staff is recommended against it and, and i always don't agree with staff um on everything that's recommended um, but this actually seems reasonable um 
although in my heart I, I want it to happen. And next year we will make sure that this happens, you know, pending, you know, nothing crazy happening in the world, you know, but um, so, but thank you again. And I appreciate it. And I hear your passion. So thank you um, for, for, for your words um, and for the time that you've given to this. So all right, thank you. That's all. Um, I know several of you have had a chance to speak, and I've, I, I wanted to say a couple of words, um, and I will come back to you all, and then we probably need to wrap this up. Um, as anyone here knows, this is one of my favorite events in Elgin, and for all of the reasons that people have stated, that it has put us on the map in a very positive way. People come here, they see Elgin very differently, um, they have a good time our downtown businesses um, benefit from this event and considering everything that has gone on in the past two years with the pandemic they need that um, and I think our community needs that in my day job I, I work with other municipalities around the, the region and they are actively bringing back their special events this year and they are looking forward to it their um, residents are looking forward to it their sponsors are looking forward to it yes understanding that it is a risk um, but I think the fact that it is outside uh, does um, help us in, in, in that manner um, I, I kind of look at this a little bit differently in terms of when we talk about you know we're talking about costs I've heard that a couple of times it, I, I look at that additional potential cost as an investment back in our community. We can't always just look at things from a dollar perspective. It's a quality of life issue. It's, it's an investment and um, a return on investment for our businesses downtown um, in our community. And I have full faith in this, commu in this committee and, and our staff um, to put forth something that you all are gonna be comfortable with and that our com community is gonna be proud of and that folks are going to be happy with when they come to Elgin. Um, with that said, I did have some questions or just needed some clarification on the beer vendors. Those bids came back, you said you had three. Um, has a decision been made yet in terms of, or are you leaning towards one or the other? Um, it, it, we have not made a decision yet. Um, we had two beer vendors to come back. Um, both are both of those were downtown businesses and um, submitted submitted good proposals. Uh, the concern there is just that the the size of the event is a um, a little outside the scope of what their proposals detailed that they've had experience with. Um, but they would, and I think you said I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think you said that even if they were not selected, they would not be precluded from selling alcohol. Correct. Yeah, if, if if we chose to go with an outside vendor, which just for the security of of that aspect of the event would be my recommendation, um, both businesses would be eligible to sell alcohol in, from an individual, a single booth in the zone, inside the zone. Um, similar to what Martini Room has done in the past and and uh, other other liquor licensed businesses downtown. Another question, and I know it's it's you know it's April. Um, does the committee feel like they have enough time to do um, what they need to do to pull this off for October? Um, well, the committee in in the individuals that have uh, their aspects. I know Fred is very confident in his build. Um, I know that Alice is hopping on social media to to uh, manage that every day. Um, their aspects are well taken care of it's the, the, volunteer the volunteers aspect. the rentals um you know i've got a couple of contacts in the music industry who are telling me that you know bands are are in high demand again this year they're trying to book things up and so we are behind the ball in terms of planning by having waited until now um it it, it does put a stressor on the success of the event just to make sure that we can get all of the fencing that we need to at the estimated cost that I provided versus a higher cost because they're running low. If any of the stages have already been booked down in Florida, it's gonna be harder to get those either 
back up to this, this area for that, that month or find one that's, that is in the area. So it, it, there are a lot of factors at play that an event of this size would benefit from being planned in January, um, February, right around then. But um, I, it, is, it is possible. It just has more obstacles in its way. Got it. Um, I, I guess, so for, for, as far as I'm concerned, I would be comfortable with, with moving forward with the event. I, I mean, I, that's just, I think, just from what I've seen from people, um, what I've heard, my confidence in, in, in the team, I think we can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm just an optimist like that. Um, and we need something back in Elgin. All of our neighbors are really actively planning things. Um, and if it, if it has to be tweaked or toned down a little bit, I think that people would be okay with that, considering this is the first year we're bringing it back from being on a two-year hiatus from the pandemic. Um, I think going three years um, at a time when other folks are bringing stuff back, I think that hurts us more than doing a toned-down um, event uh, would hurt us. Um, so. If, if there aren't any other questions or comments from, there's one. Councilwoman uh, Rauschenberger. Yeah, yeah no, uh, I, I would just say that listening to um, your main com uh, committee's enthusiasm about it, I will support it this year. Councilman Thorne. Thank you. Could you refresh us again on uh, Mr. Shannon's comments to you and why he who was so involved before well, and so engaged yeah i haven't spoken to him directly i just he, he was not uh elgin public house did not submit a proposal this year for beer vending services i don't know um what what discussions were had regarding that i just know that um i don't i i don't want to put any words in his mouth about whether he's focusing more on staffing the business or, or what the case is that that um had him pull back from submitting a proposal but he did not suppose uh, he did not submit one this year and he has been the beer vendor since the inception of the event and the beer vendor that the outside beer vendor that we have gotten a proposal from has a good reputation um yes he does he uh well the one that i, I just asked him to provide you know a, an estimate of what he would charge it's not necessarily the vendor that we would need to go with um but i did ask if he had any specific examples that he could tell me that would reflect kind of the numbers that we see in the in the amount um, and he did give me a few examples that they were responsible for uh, the long grove chocolate fest strawberry fest and apple fest um, taste of river north which is now known as river north live um, up until they did moved everything in-house they were the beer provider for the chicago marathon um, and then he does have a team member on on his staff that is responsible for all of the bars for uh, riot fest in chicago which is a multi-day uh, music festival so familiar with that one Thank you. Um, so I guess this question would be for the manager um, in terms of the council providing direction. Would, would, because there's a lot of different comments I've heard up here. Uh, we probably should take maybe a, a roll call vote, and then I, I will. And the other things, I think that staff would need direction on if the direction is to move forward. Is there, um, would it be appropriate for us to set a not to exceed budget? It would, I don't think that, that Ms. O'Leary would want to agree to that. Um, one of the things, and, and, and she can provide more information, just in the time that we've been working on cost proposals since this was initially created, the costs are changing all the time. For instance, an example, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the vendor that we use for tents, we used to be able to compete for pricing on that. That market has changed so that there is one vendor who is not who has now bought out all of its competitors and the pricing is going up that same. So we could look for a not to exceed number, but I wouldn't want to cap it if it meant having to go for a less than capable vendor or what we needed to make a successful event. Can't we just buy our own tents from Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> just say it. Um, so, um, heard a lot from the council tonight a lot of discussion really appreciate the, the comments and the feedback from staff and from the public is there a motion uh, from the board I I uh, 
move to support the um, nightmare on Chicago Street for this year, 2020? To Is there a second? <laughs> second. Motion has been made and second. Any other discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? No. Good? Yes. Martinez? No. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? No. Thorne? No. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion fails. We tried. What was the vote? 4 3. Thank you, Ms. O'Leary. And again, as, as she has promised the council and, and the members of the public, this, this is not the end of Nightmare on Chicago Street. Oh. Work will immediately begin on the work that's necessary to bring this back with the same level of appreciation and success that we've been able to accomplish in the previous nine years. We're going to see it again in some mm -hmm. shape or form. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. And yeah. if I might add, since it will be three years since we've had Nightmare, then I would love to see our city manager uh, dressed up at Nightmare on Chicago Street. When Deal. Comes back. Deal. <laughs> Great. Thank it you. won't take much effort. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, um, next item on the agenda, initiatives and other items. City Manager Kozel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first item is item B, amendments to the 2021 budget consistent with the Illinois Municipal Budget Law. The city's annual budgets are prepared using revenue estimates and expender recommendations that are inherently speculative in nature. Um, that's what makes budgets so impossible to predict with absolute and complete certainty. However, the Illinois law provides a mechanism so that when all expenditures and revenues have been accounted for in the previous year and the city council makes expenditures or, or other reductions that weren't originally contemplated with the adopted budget, the procedure that we have before us right now is to amend that 2020 or the previous year's budget to reflect the actual expenditure, expenditures and expenses. The amendments required under the law require actual revenue or expenditure that exceeds what was in the budgeted to be documented. Under budget items are not normally amended. The most significant amendments have been previously reported to the City Council and as many of you probably aware um, the most significant is the pre-funding of the police and fire pensions in the amount of six point eight million dollars that's not something that was contemplated with the adoption of the 2021 budget but when revenues um, uh, revenue in excess of what was budgeted presented an opportunity to make that advance payment to keep the property tax levy flat the council moved to approve that that's just one example and there's others that are detailed in the memo move for approval second, second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any questions or discussion from the council? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 9-0. Item C is a professional services agreement with Smith Group Incorporated for updating the Parks and Recreation Department's master plan and conducting a market assessment program for the sports complex. The 2011 Parks and Recreation Department master plan has served the city well and many of the recommendations have been implemented over the past 11 years. Um, much has changed during that time and an updated master plan will better guide the next decade of parks and recreation initiatives. With the planned market assessment for the sports complex having been shelved for the past two years during the pandemic conditions, completing that market assessment it nicely dovetails with the adoption of an updated master plan. Both will be completed together to help inform those decisions. Move for approval. Second. Motion has been made and second. Any discussion from the council? Councilman Shaw. Just a couple, uh, just one question for staff, just as a follow up offline. I just would be curious to see like uh, any recent studies that this uh, organization has done for other communities um, and maybe just like a sample of their work or something like that. And the reason I say that is I feel like we went with this vendor because they did the one in 2011. I'd just be kind of curious to see if they've had any uh, uh, recent examples with other communities and stuff like that. Sure. I will have Parks and Recreation yeah. Director Maria Campata talk to you, but you are correct in the sense the experience that Smith Group has with the city was influential in the decision yeah. because of that knowledge. You're to correct. And Thank totally you. acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. 
Any other questions? Councilman Dixon. Uh, thank you. For the city manager, mm -hmm. uh, does this also mean that we're going to have a, a public conversation about um, about that plan in the near future too as well and what parks to include or ideas and things of that nature? There will be a, an outreach component that will be part of the, the, um, the update to the comprehensive master plan. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilman Rauschenberger. Um, yes, thank you. I think it is um, um, a great idea at this moment also to conduct a market as assessment of the sports complex. Um, you know, other communities have built facilities all around us. Um, what they thought maybe 10 or 15 years ago may not be um, as relevant today. So I think that's uh, before we spend the money um, on specific things, it would be great to have a, a market assessment for um, developing the sports complex. Thank you. Yeah, and that's exactly the purpose behind that assessment. Thank you. Any other comments? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 9 0. 7 0. Item D is an approval of the First Amendment agreement, uh, First Amendment to the agreement with Pingree LLC regarding certain public improvements in the Highland Woods subdivision and Foy property. Council may recall from the last meeting, um, there's a couple instances in which developers um, started construction in subdivisions and then the, the recession kicked in in 2007, questioning the need to complete public improvements when houses weren't being constructed. Uh, in recognition of the changed market conditions, the city entered into agreements with developers that, that postponed the, the uh, construction of certain public improvements until a certain number of building permits were issued. Um, this is a similar instance in which the city provided such relief. Um, at issue in this particular instance is a request to extend the sidewalk requirements for an additional 10 years to a 20-year term from the date of the original agreement. And this is, again, simply because there are areas in this development have not, that have not yet um, seen permitting for the residences that are contemplated. Move for approval. Second. Motion has been made and second. Any comments from the council? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Item E is a design and construction engineering services agreement with Fair Graham and Associates for the 2022 parking lot and alley maintenance program. City seeking to hire this engineering firm to design um, the work that will involve pavement repairs, milling and resurfacing and drainage improvements in a number of city parking lots and alleys. Uh, upon completing that work, the engineering firm will assist the city in advertising and warding the bids and will also then perform construction engineering services including full-time field inspection, administration, construction documentation, and general coordination and control of the day-to-day -day construction activities. Second. second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any questions, comments from the council? Hearing none, will the ple clerk please call the roll. Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Items F and G are companion pieces of sort. Uh, item F is a resolution for improvements under the Illinois Highway Code, the 2022 Central Area Resurfacing Project. A resolution for improvement under the Illinois Highway Code is sometimes referred to as the MFT construction resolution. This resolution identifies the city's plans for allocating its motor fuel tax funds towards construction improvements in the current year. Approving this resolution is required by the Illinois Department of Transportation, which then reviews and approves city MFT expenditures. With this resolution, staff is presenting the project limits and scope of work for the 2022 Central Area Resurfacing Project. That area generally includes the, prop, the, the streets on Grove Avenue, Hiawatha Drive, St. John Street, West Chicago Street, South Crystal Street, and North Jackson Street. Move for approval. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any comments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Members Dixon? Yes. 
Good. Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Item G is a second resolution for maintenance under the Illinois Highway Code using 2022 motor fuel tax funds. With this resolution, staff is identifying the purchase of streetlight electricity charges, pavement marking services, salt and de-icing materials for snow and ice control on roadways, and asphalt and concrete materials that will be used by the city staff during 2022, again, with MFT funds allocated from the state. Move for approval. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Item H is an agreement with Cyclomedia Technology Incorporated for degree street level imaging and asset extraction. Public Works Department likes knowing where its street signs, street lights, manhole covers, and all kinds of things are located. By utilizing the latest technology, which includes a 100 mega megapixel camera and 3D laser imaging, Cyclomedia's fleet of vehicles will be able to capture Elgin streets and produce 360 degree high resolution photosphere images within six months of the initiation of this project. With this street imagery, staff will have access to its own version of Google Street View, but with a much higher level of precision. By employing Cyclomedia's artificial intelligence, along with its human quality assurance and accuracy review, the combined system will be able to create an accurate inventory of the city's assets. Move for approval. Second. <clears throat> Motion's been made and seconded. Any comments? Councilman Shaw. I should have asked a couple of questions, I guess, before, but just I mean, what's the level of confidence, I guess, in this project? So I know that you know we, we've gone through an imaging system and, and solution in the past. I think from the notes, it was clear that that didn't pan out as what we'd expected. I'm just kind of curious to get a, and, and we can and we can do this, you know, in between the, the next council meeting too. I'm, I'm fine with that. I did not ask uh, prior to the meeting, so I don't want to. That's not. That's that's a, so we can we can we can talk offline too. It's a, Director Massey referred to that level of confidence. It's in the final paragraph, not with the detail that you're expecting, but the work that he did in, in terms of the combination of the artificial intelligence, however, along with Cyclomedia's proven track record of cleaning up whatever those errors are, provides him with the assurance this will be the okay. best product that we've used to date. Okay. Additionally, though, too, we also have a whole roster of GIS staff that has the ability, once that's implemented, yeah. to provide yet that other additional level of review. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, will the clerk, clerk please call the roll? Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes, motion carries, seven zero. Item I is a professional services agreement with the Will Group for the, phase, for the second phase of the LED street light conversion management program. The phase two lighting conversion work is going to be focusing on the city's decorative lighting infrastructure, and that uh, comprises about 50% of the city's roadway lighting. Um, as many of you recall, in 2021, the city completed the conversion of 2,700 municipally owned and maintained Cobra head light fixtures. The 3,000 decorative fixtures contemplated under this program will be, repla will be replaced under the phase two deliverables. At the conclusion of phase two, all of the city's roadway lighting will be updated to LED with smaller projects in the out years addressing parking lots and other minor facilities. Move for approval. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any comments? Councilman Dixon. Uh, thank you. Um, a question for city manager uh, about the contracting of this. If I understand this correctly, we entered into, uh, this is phase two and this is a separate contract. Phase one was a, another contract. But then in the materials, uh, it looks like it advised that going forward, since we're happy with that work, we're just going to do one contract, one remaining contract to cover everything else. Am I understanding that correctly? The Will Group will be managing this project. It will go out and will select a vendor to complete the, the work, but consistent with the work that it performed, where it, over, where it provided that oversight of a contractor doing forward, yes, and that is okay. this is the, the continuation of that previous success. Okay, so this won't have to continuously come back for the Will Group. 
No, after this, yeah, is, um, as I referred to in that very last sentence, it will not necessarily be the will group as we look on those smaller right. ancillary items after this. It's okay. this, yes, the decorative street lights and the cobra heads is what comprises the okay. scope of the will group agreement. Okay, Sorry. all right, mm -hmm. sounds good, thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> me and myself and a few of my colleagues, we visited the will group um, last year to see their production and it was just a well-run organization. Um, they really do a fabulous job and we enjoyed ourselves. So um, thank you and here you are, right here, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a great contract. It's a minority firm, black owned firm and, um, and we're really happy and excited to continue be, to be able to do business with them. So thank you. And I see Mr. Pubitz at the dais. Mm -hmm. Always at the ready. Do you have any comments, anything you wanna add? I'm, I'm just here to answer questions and Manager Kozel took that last one very well, so I don't really have anything to add, but if there are other questions. He'll tell me something otherwise, not in public, so. <laughs> Councilman Thorne. Thank you. I'm just curious if this is going to alter any of the aesthetics of some of the vintage looking light structures in the historic district. I can take that question. I think what you'll see is a slightly different light color so it runs from kind of the orangish up to the whites and then the blues. So you might notice a slightly different light color, but I think the overall effect of the lighting will be as good or better. Um, the lighting color that we're using is designed to illuminate very well without being overpowering. We certainly aren't going towards this, like this white of a light that gets into the blue range. So, but I think you'll be pleased with the results. Good deal, thank you. You're very welcome. Councilman Good. <clears throat> uh, I, throughout this process, I'm, I'm wondering if there's gonna be an opportunity, you know, I, I live in the downtown and I hear from mm -hmm. apartment dwellers down there. Um, you know, some of the light will shoot up from these poles. Is there gonna be an opportunity to put a, a hood on top of these, perhaps? There certainly will. We'll be including uh, shielding uh, specifications in our contract. We don't have them selected yet, the exact types, but It'll probably be in the form of either a bulb design or just physical shields that will block up lighting is really what we're concerned about. Our goal is to get light on the sidewalks and lights on the pavement. Uh, we've been using the International Dark Sky Association Excellent. model as a guide. We don't have specific light reduction standards that we're requiring to be met, but our first goal is providing safety to pedestrians and to motorists because this is street lighting. But then a secondary goal is to minimize light spillover or light pollution. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Unless you want light shining up in your window, we can figure that out too. No, it'd be nice. If, yeah, okay. a sidewalk would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Item J is amendment number one to the engineering services agreement with Baxter and Woodman Incorporated for the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit Phase Two Stormwater Permit Compliance Project. NPDES permit, as it's commonly known, is mandated by federal and state law and governs the city's operation of its storm, storm sewer system. Permit and clock. Permit compliance includes um, items such as public outreach and involvement, um, the monitoring of any discharge into the river, and the eliminating uh, and construction of site runoff control. Um, and additionally, post-construction stormwater management, and as we all know, the removal of, of combined sewers. This agreement continues the ongoing engineering services agreement the city has with Baxter and Woodman to meet the regulations required during the 2022 programming year. Move for approval. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any comments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Item K is change order number one and final for the Leo Nelson Riverside Water Treatment Plant Aeration Piping Replacement Project. As part of this project, the city was required to create a shower facility in the event that 
employees came in contact with the chemicals that are used for the treatment of water. The original design of that shower, um, when it was, it was determined that piping providing the water to that shower was not in a feasible location, a new location was identified. That work wasn't contemplated as part of the original bid. This is the approval for the $8,500 in additional cost necessary to ideally situate the shower facility. Move for approval. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any comments, discussion from the council? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, we have a number of items on our regular agenda. I would entertain a motion for us to adjourn uh, to the regular meeting. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Please call the roll. Thank you, clerk. Council Member Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. We will reconvene the regular meeting at 720.
call the city council meeting for April 13th, 2022 to order. If everyone would like to stand and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll call the roll. Council members Dixon? Here. Good? Here. Martinez? Here. Powell? Here. Rauschenberger? Here. Shaw? Here. Stefan? Thorne? Here. Mayor Captain? With the absence of Mayor Captain, I'll accept a motion for Mayor Pro Tem. Make a motion to appoint uh, Councilman Tish Powell as Mayor Pro Tem. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Oh, okay. I'm not it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Powell? Yes. Braschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, approval of the minutes from the previous meeting of March 23rd, 2022. Move for approval. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any amendments or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, next item on the agenda are communications. We have several proclamations uh, tonight, uh, several folks here in the audience uh, that will be recognized. Um, I'm going to come down um, to the podium and, and start uh, calling some of you up. Uh, the, I'm going to read these first just to uh, give folks an idea of, of, of what's, uh, what's on the list. Uh, we have the Long Red Line, 10th anniversary. We have an Earth Day proclamation, we have National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, and we have Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week. If Ramona Burns and Vicki Thorne can meet me at the podium, please. So the, red, the Long Red Line 10-year uh, anniversary is Elgin's expression of one billion rising. It's the global upsurge of women and their allies in resistance to rape and all forms of interpersonal violence. I, I think this is particularly um, important right now as we have heard from law enforcement that during COVID, when folks were sheltered in place, uh, many folks who were victims of domestic violence found themselves um, sheltered in place and captive with their abusers in many cases. So we did see a, an uptick in domestic violence cases. So um, just want to bring that to everyone's attention and just to um, be diligent <clears throat> in, um, in this area. The proclamation reads, whereas 2022 is the 10th anniversary of Elgin's The Long Red Line Awareness and Prevention Campaign in collaboration with survivors of sexual assault, social services, arts, and institutions to host our expression of the global movement, One Billion Rising, a mass action to stop violence against women and others. And whereas April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month and May 5th, is Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Awareness Day to honor the one in three women who experience violence in their lifetime. Recognize that these numbers increase exponentially for Black, Indigenous, Latina, Asian, transgender, two-spirit, and gender-fluid women. Acknowledge that gender-based violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and missing and murdered Indigenous women and relatives are human rights issues 
which our community must work together to address through improved data collection, prevention, public awareness, and education. And whereas last year in Elgin, 1,155 women, men, and children were victims of sexual assault or domestic violence. Last year in Illinois, 267 human trafficking cases were identified, and in North America, including Illinois urban areas, 4,293 indigenous women, children, and relatives were reported as missing, murdered, or trafficked. And whereas Elgin has long remained committed to nonviolence and violence prevention education to ensure a safe and vibrant community for all women, groups, and cultures free from sexual assault, discrimination, homophobia, racism, human trafficking, violence, and exploitation, and whereas we acknowledge, honor, and celebrate the healing, courage, and wisdom of survivors of sexual assault and other forms of exploitation. Now, therefore, I, Tish Powell, um, on behalf of Mayor David Captain of the city of Elgin, Illinois, do hereby proclaim and declare that April 1st through May 5th, 2022, shall be known as the Long Red Line Sexual Assault and Exploitation Awareness Weeks and urge all citizens to support and honor their survivors, victims, and families of gender-based violence, human trafficking, rape, and exploitation. As the community chair for the previous seven years, it's an honor to receive this recognition for the hard work that has gone into the past decade. And we're continuing to bring awareness just as to just how endemic violence against women is in our communities. We're not stopping May 5th. I publicly broke my silence of 40 years at the very first One Billion Rising event. And it was a very empowering moment for me in that it helped me reclaim my voice by speaking truth it helped me see that my story, my voice, could be a benefit to others who are tending and mending their own trauma. And what I found is every year that I speak, I am the right voice for at least one someone to step on the path of healing. This year, my gratitude to Ramona Burns for stepping in to chair this year's event um, and expanding our awareness about human trafficking and missing and murdered indigenous, indigenous, uh, ah, indigenous women and relatives. I wanna thank uh, the city of Elgin and, and the community of Elgin for actually um, stepping up and supporting me when I, my son went missing for 10 days almost two years ago. Obviously, this is a very sensitive area for me to speak, so please bear with my, uh, my hesitation in speaking. My hope was that my, um, my sister and my niece would be uh, able to attend here so that they could speak from firsthand experience on what that was like. Um, fortunately, our story had a good ending, which unfortunately is rare among these instances. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge Rahab's Daughters, who is uh, based in Barrington. They have been really supportive of our endeavor in bringing awareness here to this community. In partnership with the League of Women Voters and AUW, we have had, um, as well as sovereign bodies, I want to acknowledge them. Um, and, uh, and actually, as the community and all the resources that we have here, which is what this month for us uh, in the Longwood Line, coming out on this side of uh, COVID, kind of dusting off these relationships that we've had with the Crisis Center, with ECC, and all of the numerous partners that we've had throughout the years. Um, so I just wanted to give my, uh, show my appreciation. We had um, over 200 people show up from across the world. I believe it was the power of prayer that brought my son back. Um, and um, people from Elgin, you know, this was out of state, they, they, they showed up. So 
I think that's really what it's about is showing up. So thank you. <laughs> In closing, I would just like to say to, uh, we're continuing participation with, uh, uh, into the fall with uh, the Crisis Center for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we are also going to end this 10th year on Valentine's Day 2023 with a physical long red line where people are joining scarves hand to hand in solidarity and support for victims and their families. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Will Tom Armstrong join me at the podium? Tom will be accepting the proclamation on behalf of the Sustainability Commission for the City of Elgin. And the proclamation reads, whereas the first Earth Day was celebrated on April 22nd, 1970, with the goal of inspiring environmental awareness and encouraging the conservation, protection, and appreciation of our nation's natural resources. And whereas the celebration of this day marks an annual review of the commitment to the principles of the first Earth Day and makes a renewed commitment to environmental stewardship and to the implementation of sustainability efforts. And whereas the global community now faces extraordinary challenges, such as environmental degradation, global health issues, climate change, food and water shortages, and whereas a green economy can be achieved on the individual level through education, public policy, and consumer activism campaigns, and it is understood that the citizens of the global community must step forward and take action to create positive environmental change to combat the aforementioned global challenges. And whereas the city of Elgin celebrates Earth Day by, ex by extending it to the month of April in recognition of the commitment to environmental stewardship and the city of Elgin residents are encouraged to implement practices designed to preserve and protect our environment and shape the future of our environmental security. Now, therefore, I, Tish Powell, on behalf of Mayor David Captain of the city of Elgin, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2022 as Earth Month and urge all citizens to be mindful of laws which protect our environment and join in efforts to preserve the beauty and diversity of our planet Earth and the city of Elgin. On behalf of the Sustainable Commission and numerous allied groups in the city of Elgin uh, concerned with the impacts of climate change and the topic of sustainability generally, I want to thank Mayor Captain, Mayor Pro Tem, Powell, and the members of the City Council for again recognizing the month of April as Earth Month. You have shown great leadership in budgeting to hire a sustainability analyst to establish a baseline greenhouse gas inventory to light our streets with LED lamps, to expand the tree planting program, and to endorse the Chicago Regional Climate Action Plan, plus offering community solar and other solar programming uh, to the residents and businesses of Elgin. The theme for Earth Day 2022 is invest in our planet. So all together now, this is the moment to change it all, the business climate, the political climate, and how we take action on climate. Now is the time for the unstoppable courage to preserve and protect our health, our families, our livelihoods. Together, we must invest in our planet because a green future is a prosperous future. We need to act boldly, innovate broadly, and implement equitably. It's going to take all of us, all in. Business and industry, government, education, development, transportation, utilities, not-for-profits, social services, religious affiliations, healthcare, and citizens. Everyone accounted for and everyone accountable. A partnership for the planet. And while there is still time to solve the climate crisis, time to choose both a prosperous and sustainable future, and time to restore nature and build a healthy planet for our children and their children, 
time is short. As we approach the 52nd Earth Day on April 22nd, let us be mindful that every day should be Earth Day and every month Earth Month. So let us, as a community, be all in to invest in our planet. Thank you. Next we have the National Public Safety Telecommuter Telecommunicators Week proclamation. Can I have uh, Deputy Chief Schusler and 911 Supervisor Joe Beth Robinson. Whereas each day thousands of Americans dial 911 for help in emergencies and the men and women who answer these calls for help gathering essential information and dispatching the appropriate assistance can often make the difference between life and death for persons in need. And whereas the city of Elgin's public safety telecommunicators are among the more than 200,000 telecommunication specialists who work daily to protect and promote public safety, and whereas public safety telecommunicators are more than a calm and reassuring voice at the other end of the phone, they are knowledgeable and highly trained individuals who not only work closely with the police and fire departments, but numerous other state and local agencies, as well as other departments within the city. And whereas, because emergencies can strike at any time, we rely on the vigilance and the preparedness of these individuals 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I'm gonna say that one more time. 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. I don't think people really think about that. Whereas the city of Elgin recognizes the need to maintain the highest standards of public safety, and we owe a great debt to the men and women who by applying their expertise in telecommunications help to make that achievement possible. Now, therefore, I, Tish Powell, on behalf of Mayor David Captain, Mayor of the City of Elgin, Illinois, on behalf of the entire City Council and staff, do hereby proclaim April 10th through April 16th, 2022, as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And we acknowledge that a debt of appreciation and extend a heartfelt thank you to each of them. I'm gonna let you guys speak, but I, I just wanna say something because I know when we often talk about public safety in our community, people think about police and fire, but they don't often think about the telecommunicators that are part of our police department that dispatch all of those calls. They have a very stressful job. And I know that the turnover for these positions a lot of times is, is pretty high. So we really appreciate the work that you all do. I know I couldn't do it, um, and probably a whole lot of us here in the room couldn't do it. Um, I, I can't imagine the calls that you get, and people panicked because a loved one is in a crisis, and you have to be able to calm them down uh, enough to understand what it is they need and to get the proper help to them. So thank you for that work. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. So this is the fifth proclamation I've been honored to come here and receive from the city of Elgin. And I just want to say thank you to the city as well as the citizen on behalf of my entire division um, and as well as all of the telecommunicators that have come through the Elgin Police Department. On any given day, the, Elgin, the police department as well as us telecommunicators can deal with just calls alone anywhere from 350 to 500 calls a day. Um, depending upon which need to go out for dispatch on the fire side or the police side. So at any given moment, I could be a call taker and on one single shift filtering those hundreds of calls to families that need us. And I think that it's the real support of the citizens as well as the city that allow us to be prepared, allow us to be well trained. And without that kind of support, I don't think we would be having a telecommunicator week to celebrate. <laughs> so I can't thank you guys enough and I look forward to seeing you guys next year. <laughs> And last but not least, uh, Chief Lally and Animal Control <laughs> Officer Blake Stevens for Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week.
whereas the National Animal Care and Control Association de designated the second full week of April as National Animal and Control Appreciation Week, and whereas various federal, state, and local government officials throughout the country take this time to recognize, thank, and commend all animal control officers and animal services staff for the dedicated service they provide to the citizens, public safety, and domestic animals and livestock across the nation. And whereas every day animal control officers and animal control technicians put themselves in potentially dangerous situations to protect the health and welfare of all kinds of animals and the public. And whereas Elgin recognizes and commends the animal control division personnel who answer calls for assistance, capture roaming and potentially dangerous animals, rescue animals, investigate reports of animal abuse, educate pet owners about responsible care, and mediate disputes between neighbors regarding pets. Now, therefore, I, Tish Powell, on behalf of Mayor, Mayor David Captain, Mayor of the City of Elgin, do hereby proclaim the week of April 10th through April 16th, 2022, as Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week, and encourages all citizens to join us in expressing their sincere appreciation for the service and dedication of our animal control employees. On behalf of myself and Officer Mazzozic, we are truly honored to receive this. Um, we appreciate being recognized and it does mean a lot to the both of us. We are both very proud and take pride in what we do in helping that not only the citizens of this great city, but as well as the animals. And being able to reunite animals back with their loved ones is truly a blessing. So again, thank you. next item on the agenda is uh, public comment. We did not have anyone sign up for public comment tonight. So we will move on to bids. The first bid is bid 22-011 for pavement marking program in the amount of $354,473. Make the motion to award the bid to maintenance coating companies in the amount of three hundred fifty-four thousand four hundred seventy-three dollars. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmembers Dixon. Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Rashmerger. Yes. Shaw. Yes. Thorne. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell. Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Second bid is bid 22 012 with Portland Cement Concrete. I make the motion that we uh, purchase from Ozinga Ready Mix Concrete uh, amount for concrete not to exceed $80,000. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any comments or discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Item 3 is a bid. It's bid number 22-013 for bituminous asphalt groups one and two. A motion to award uh, bituminous, bituminous patching mixtures group one and two in the amount not to exceed $250,000 from multiple vendors in accordance with the Illinois Department of Transportation regulations for motor fuel tax allocation. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. 
Good. Yes. Martinez? Yes. Braschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Item 4, bid number 22 022, HVAC replacement. I'll make a motion to approve contract with Hartwick. Hartwick Mechanical Incorporated to replace HVAC equipment in the amount of $198,268. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Item number seven, job order contract with, uh, for Walton Island paint, painting. I make the motion. Passion. Make the motion that we award the contract to FH Passion in the amount of $90,931. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Item 6 is a joint purchasing cooperative uh, contract for with Kenokia Minolta Facility Management. We made the motion to board the bid to Kanaka Minolta in the amount of $225,710. Second. second motion has been made and seconded any discussion seeing none will the clerk please call the roll councilmember Stixon? yes good yes martinez yes brashenberger yes shaw yes thorn yes mayor pro tem powell yes motion passes seven zero Thank you, Councilmember Paul. I just want to, I see Dana Denai, our purchasing director, out in the audience, and this is a particularly significant initiative that she's bringing forward to the council because it's saving money. Um, this is an initiative that's going to be saving the city about $80,000 over the next three years, and we're contracting out for services in which we used to have a full-time employee. Ms. Denai has been working to identify a more efficient and cost-effective means of uh, providing these services to the city, and uh, I applaud her efforts, as I know we all all do for taking this initiative. Thanks, Dana. Thanks. Thank you, Dana. Item number seven is a suburban purchasing cooperative for fleet purchases in the amount of $1.1 million. Make the motion to award the bid to the multiple lowest responsible bidders in the amount of $1,176,336. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Councilwoman Rauschenberger. I would just like to um, thank the uh, city manager's office as well as our uh, sustainability analyst and um, who, the uh, department in charge of our um, fleets that um, we are not at this time um, looking at purchasing electric vehicles, but there is plans um, for our next purchase um, to be um, uh, you know, analyzing what kind of um, vehicles we could um, purchase that have that ca electric capability and that will be usable. Absolutely correct. Um, there will be one more recommendation for vehicle purchases this year, but beginning next year with direction from the Council Sustainability Commission and the Commission, we will begin seeing higher incidents of electric vehicles in the city's fleet. You're absolutely correct. Any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Item passes 7 0. Item 8 is a bid for Midwestern Higher Education Commission contract for Dell Latitude notebook computers and Dell dock stations. Motion to award the uh, purchase of Dell, <clears throat> the purchase from Dell for 65 Dell Latitude notebook computers and Dell dock stations in the amount of $65,389. Second. Second. 
The motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rashmerger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Other business. Um, item one consideration of a petition 36 21 for 1425 Gifford Road, a planned development as a map amendment to construct an addition to an existing industrial building and various site improvements. <coughs> Mr. Malat. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. You'll pardon me one second. We're having some technical difficulty getting our, our imagery up. My apologies. <laughs> Let me paint you a picture. <laughs> All right. You did this, right? I did. Did you try to swap displays? You what? And she. Well, no, that's not. But that's not what. Uh, that won't put the image up there. That'll just. Gotcha. Yeah, something. Oh, I see. You see what I mean? Yeah. Well, they'll be in slight miniature. So, uh, if you'll squint real hard, you well. Want to try It'll be a little small, so focus on the upper left-hand side of the screen, if you will. Uh, again, my apologies. Uh, this first item, the property is located at the southeast corner of Gifford and Spalding Roads. Here is Gifford. This is Spalding. West Bartlett Road is located along the bottom of the screen. Concrete Specialties is here. Elgin Sweeper is down on the lower right. Packaging Wholesalers to the left. And on the left-hand side of the screen, this is the Heron's Landing subdivision in the village of Bartlett. Uh, William Scotsman Incorporated, or Will Scott, requests approval of various site improvements at 1425 Gifford Road, including a 26,800 square foot addition to their maintenance building. The company plans to invest $3.8 million in their Elgin property. Will Scott specializes in renting portable modular office trailers and storage containers. The company is headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona, and is the North American leader of turnkey modular space and storage solutions. They have more than 275 locations across the United States, Canada, Mexico, and the UK. The 24-acre property currently includes two one-story office buildings and a 9,200-square-foot maintenance building. Most of the site is used for outdoor storage of portable office trailers and storage containers. The addition would expand the maintenance building to 36,000 square feet to accommodate the company's operations. The exterior of the addition would match the existing building with a masonry base and metal siding, and the building would be upfitted with fire alarms and a sprinkler system. As part of the project, the applicant would dedicate the northern 30 feet of its property for Spalding Road right-of-way and move their stormwater detention facilities on site. The applicant would also construct a public sidewalk along Spalding and Gifford Roads and substantially enhance the landscape screening around the perimeter of the fenced-in portion of the property used for outdoor storage. The applicant is present. Should you have any questions, staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend approval subject to the conditions outlined within your packet. Move for approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'll just say that um, this is a part of Elgin that I don't think a lot of people even think about. <laughs> Um, but I'm really excited to see that, that you all are um, locating this property and uh, doing some, some major improvements there. Uh, of all things, the sidewalk actually excites me a lot uh, <laughs> as we've been talking about that in terms of making our, our community um, more pedestrian friendly. So um, to our Sustainability in Earth Day uh, proclamation, that, that all ties in.
Seeing no other comments, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Item number two consideration of petition 63 21 1570 North Randall Road conditional use to establish accessory package liquor sales and an existing motor vehicle service station with a convenience store mr. Malat thank you and my appreciation we now have full screen <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> this property is located on the Did, didn't here. we just spend a whole lot of money on this? No, no, no. This is the, <laughs> hey, hey, our line of work is is usually between the, the, the chair and the keyboard, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying. This never happens to Dave. There we go. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I should join the AV club, right? <laughs> All right. This property is located on the west side of Randall Road between Alf Lane and Holmes Road, opposite of Fox Lane. Randall is located here. I-90 is here. This is Fox Lane. Uh, San Filippo is located in the along the right side of the screen advocate Sherman a little to the uh, lower right hand corner the new ortho Illinois building is under construction here this is brilliant Subaru and the new Atlantic packaging also under construction is located in the upper left 7-eleven is requesting permission to sell accessory package beer wine and spirits from their existing gas station and convenience store Existing retail goods will be rearranged within the convenience store to accommodate the display of beer, wine, and spirits within coolers and on retail racks, all totaling less than 10% of the floor area. The applicant is not proposing any changes to the building or the site. The applicant is present. Should you have any questions, staff and the Planning Zoning Commission recommend approval subject conditions outlined within your packet. Move for approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussions? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Item 3 Consideration of Petition 02 22 at 1 Douglas Avenue, Unit 300, Conditional Use to Establish a Commercial Event Space. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. This property is located at the northeast corner of Chicago Street and Douglas Avenue. Here is Chicago Street and Douglas. This is the city's Spring Street parking deck, the tower building, post office, and the city hall surface parking lot. The Haight family requests approval of a commercial event space on the third floor of the building at 1 Douglas Avenue. The Ashbury, as the proposed space would be known, will be the second downtown venue owned and operated by the family who also owned the Haight at 166 Symphony Way. The 9,000 square foot Ashbury would be a sister event space to the Haight for clients looking for a smaller venue with maximum occupancy of 150 people. The converted warehouse space occupies the entire third floor of the building would be available for rent on weekdays and weekends. The applicant is available should you have any questions. Staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend approval subject to the conditions outlined within your packet. Move for approval. Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilman Thorin. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, say that I think this is a great deal. I, our city is looking for more venues like this. I've been to a number of events at the Hate Building. They have proved themselves uh, to be a wonderful asset to our community. So I compliment you on this. I welcome it and I wish you well. Any other comments? Councilwoman Rauschenberger. Uh, yeah, I also would like to um, say congratulations to the Haight family for all your contributions to um, the city of Elgin and our downtown businesses. Um, I, I think it's great that you have um, enough, uh, you know, 
events to expand. And I know that the city in general has a lot of events um, and event space. So um, congratulations and it's an interesting use for our downtown. Thanks. Any other comments? Well, you know I'm excited. I love your existing facility and you have done a wonderful job there um, and expanding it. I love the outdoor space. So I can only imagine what you're going to do with this one. So congratulations and uh, can't wait to see it. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmembers Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Item 4 Consideration of Petition 0322 1425 Madeline Lane. Program for graphics to allow one larger than permitted flag and one larger than permitted wall graphic. Mr. Merlot. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. This property is located at the southeast corner of Big Timber Road and Madeline Lane. Here is Big Timber, Madeline Lane, and Randall Road. The 7-Eleven and Ortho Illinois are here. This is Brilliant Subaru again. Amano Enzyme USA is located just to the south of the property, and the Boy Scouts Camp Big Timber is on the left-hand side of your screen. Gold Coast is a trucking service transportation company that is investing $16 million in its nearly complete 27,500 square foot North American headquarters. Gold Coast Logistics requests approval of a program for graphics. A program for graphics is a process that gives the city the opportunity to consider unique requests for signage that do not conform to certain provisions of the zoning ordinance but are more restrictive in other ways. Here, Gold Coast would like to install one U.S. flag and one wall sign that are larger than what is permitted. In return, Gold Coast would install smaller signs elsewhere on the property such that the total amount of sign area on the property is less than what would otherwise be allowed. The one larger flag and one larger wall graphic would face Big Timber to provide appropriate visibility of the headquarters building. It's worth noting that the smaller limit on the big timber facing wall sign is because Gold Coast appropriately located the loading docks on the south side of the building out of sight for most traffic on big timber. But this move pushed the building closer to big timber. If the loading docks were flipped to the north side so the building was further back from big timber, this wall sign would meet the zoning ordinance. The applicant originally proposed three flags and one wall sign that are larger than what is permitted, and the Planning and Zoning Commission did not recommend approval of that request at their March meeting. Gold Coast subsequently revised their request such that only one flag and the wall sign required departures. The applicant is present. Should you have any questions, staff recommends approval subject to the conditions outlined within your packet. Move for approval. Second. Item has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilman Dixon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Um, thank you to the company coming here to Elgin. We really appreciate you uh, making Elgin home, uh, and we look forward to having you, you here for, for years to come. I do have one question for Mark uh, about the exception that was granted. Now, as you know, a planning and zoning aficionado, not really, but <laughs> I said on planning and zoning, right? But uh, sitting through I can so many meetings we've never really made exceptions when it comes to um, signage uh, and, and things of that nature and I can see the reasoning here mm -hmm. um, but are we also then going to grant that same type of exception um, to be consistent going forward to other companies um, that's my my only question sure. what's your thinking behind no that? that's a, that's a great question I think I uh, I think we have had instances where we have deviated from the underlying standards of the zoning ordinance as they relate to signage. Um, but when we do that, we, want, we always make sure that we work with the applicant to ensure that the signs are appropriately scaled. And then in most other instances, unless it's part of a planned development, for example, that there's a trade-off. So for example, they're saying, Will, may we have one larger sign and one larger wall sign? In return, however, we'll reduce the amount of area that we would otherwise be allowed to do in these other locations. So it's a swap. Um, we, you know, it, it, as you know, and as long as that zoning ordinance is, it's not going to cover every single instance. So I think we're fortunate that we have this provision in the zoning ordinance we can use for circumstances like this to respond to this unique circumstance. and, and, and Put it, put it for you for approval. 
Perfect. That's all I got. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? Questions? Welcome. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for your investment in our community. We look forward to working with you. Item number five is ordinance number S322. This is an ordinance providing for the issuance of $13,360,000 worth of general obligation corporate purpose bonds series 2022 of the city of Elgin, Kane and Cook counties, Illinois, for the purpose of financing water and sewer utility projects and various other capital improvements within said city and paying the expenses incident thereto, providing for the levy and collection of a direct annual tax, tax sufficient to pay the principal of and interest on said bonds and authorizing the sale of said bonds to the purchaser thereof. And I would like to ask our finance director, Deb Noraki, to come up and decipher what I just said. <laughs> I heard we had a bond sale this morning. We did. Good evening. Uh, earlier this year in February, the city council approved issuing approximately $15 million in general obligation bonds to fund capital investments for utilities, representing about $10 million of that total, and an additional $5 million for parks and recreation as was approved in the 2022 adopted budget. Since that time, we've been busy preparing the city's official statement, which is a comprehensive document that provides uh, potential investors with all the information that they need to know about our bonds, our finances, and the city of Elgin. In addition to that, we have um, participated in two rating agency reviews with um, Fitch Ratings and Standard & Poor's. I'm happy to let you know that uh, Fitch Ratings once again awarded the city a AAA bond rating, and Standard & Poor's once again affirmed their AA plus rating. The bond sale occurred this morning at about 9.30. Our financial con uh, consultant, Spear Financial, put together um, an award packet which was um, placed in box this afternoon for your review. But just to summarize uh, the results of the sale, we had six bidders that um, bid 22 times trying to secure our bonds. The winning bid went to JP Morgan at a total interest cost of 2.63%. It's interesting to note that the difference in the bids um, between the six bidders was very minimal, which is indicative of the fact that the investors knew the market and what it would tolerate. <coughs> For example, the difference between the winning bid and the second lowest bid was seven one thousandths of one percent different. <laughs> and the difference between the winning bid and the highest bid was 0.13%. We felt as though it was a good time to go to market. As I'm sure um, you're aware, back in March, um, the Fed funds rate was um, increased about a quarter of a percent, and they anticipate potentially six more rate increases. Um, so we were able to get ahead of those and um, felt like we got a good rate. You know, it's higher than what we've seen in the last few years, but the last few years have just, we've been spoiled. <laughs> and we, we're getting back to normal. If we compare to our 2019 bond issue, um, the rate was 2.63%, which is what we got today. So um, the bond sale will officially close on the 27th of, 27th of this month, and at that time, the funds will be able to uh, be available to go ahead and start working on the budgeted projects. Is there a motion? Move for approval. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? 
I just like to say thanks to staff, uh, Deb, and your team. Um, I don't think people realize what this whole process undertakes. Um, I'm, it's a lot, and it's a whole lot of money. But the fact that we continue to have a triple A bond rating, um, are able to get a 2.63 percentage rate. I mean, folks are excited to, to get that kind of rate on a mortgage, but to be able to get that kind of rate on $12 million worth of bonds is, is huge for our community. And I don't think that there are a whole lot of communities in our surrounding area that could say that they have maintained a AAA bond rating for the length of time that we have. How many years is it? I'm sure you you know right off. Somebody knows. <laughs> we just want to keep it going. Yeah. But I, I I know that um, sometimes people you know say, well, why is that important? It's reasons like this that that bond rating is important. Uh, when we are uh, looking at paying interest back on twelve million dollars just a, an additional percentage um, you know, rate is, is a lot more money for us to pay back. So it does pay back dividends to our community. So thank you for your work. You're welcome. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries seven zero. Item number six, authorization for payments. Move for approval. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rashmurger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries seven zero. Consent agenda. Move for approval. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Braschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Miscellaneous business. Move for approval. Second. Make, uh, moved and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Announcements. The next Committee of the Whole meeting will be Wednesday, April 27th. 2022 at 6 p.m. in the City Council Chambers, and the next regular meeting of the Elgin City Council will be held on Wednesday, April 27th, 2022 at 7 p.m. in the City Council Chambers. I will entertain a motion to adjourn back to the Committee of the Whole meeting. So moved. Second. Will the clerk, ah, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. We are adjourned. Motion to reconvene the Committee of the Whole meeting. So, so moved. Second. Clerk, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. Thank you. I know I got a couple of looks because everyone thought we were done. Um, we were pretty much finished. Um, the only uh, things that were left were announcements from council and announcements from staff, but I wanted to. Uh, get to our regular meetings since we had so many uh, proclamations. So, announcements from council. 
Mr. Dixon. Yeah, not so much of a, an announcement, so to speak, but um, over the weekend, um, there was a shooting that occurred uh, and a couple of people have lost their lives. Um, a few people were injured. Um, and um, my con I want to give my condolences to those families who, who have lost um, some young men in their family. And we've seen a few different shootings. I believe there was another one just probably while we were here in this meeting. Um, and we were in this, yeah, so I, I, got, that, I got that flash. Um, and it was actually a guy that I went to high school with, the, late, the latest one that was shot. Um, another one that was shot is a, a friend of my son that was actually murdered. Um, and the other one is a guy that I went to high school with. Um, um, his family member was also murdered too as well. And, and it just, it's just heartbreaking because there are, um, this community is so, so close knit you know, if there's not six degrees of separation here, it's more like 0 0.5, right? So either you know them or you're close to the people that, um, you're somewhere close to, to, to that person. Um, and it's just, it's just heartbreak. I mean, I'm just lost for words over these shootings and the way that they keep on occurring. Um, and I know our, our police department is doing everything that they possibly can. And uh, I had a conversation with Anna about this day before yesterday, um, or yesterday morning actually. Um, and I know they're out there and they're working it. And and who you know, whoever is responsible for this, um, you know, I just implore you just to you know, bring come come forward. Um, if anybody knows anything, please cooperate. Um, and for the families that are out there um, that are impacted by this, just know that the, the city is with you. If you need anything, please reach out. Um, the police department has a, a plethora of resources that's ready and available for you. Um, uh, but again, just my condolences and, um, and the city is in my prayers and, and those families that are impacted in, are in my prayers and, and also uh, those who witness what happened because that is a, a very traumatic situation uh, that that has occurred and occurred again today. So um, that's all I have to say. Ms. Brauschenberger. Um, yeah, thank you. I also wanted to comment. Um, this is, of course, not the kind of news we would like to have in our city of Elgin. Um, and uh, I know this has made not only uh, local, but uh, regional and national news. Um, I want to um, send my condolences also to the families of young men that have um, passed away in this moment. And I also, it's closer to my heart in this um, situation. Um, my daughter just sent me um, a text that a young man was shot outside the gym that she attends. Um, you know, it's close to home and um, uh, we the, as a community need to uh, come together and, and, you know, I think one of the main reasons for all this is the availability of guns in our society. I know that our police force is doing the best they can. They can't predict um, who is going to be where and what young people have a gun available to them. Um, I also want to give a, um, kudos to um, School District U46. Um, I, I work at Coleman School and 30 plus children that attend Coleman School lived in the apartment complex on Congdon Avenue where this incident took place and U46 had counselors and teachers were prepared to talk to the students about this incident and um, to have community su support for those kids because this is trauma, this is trauma for them. So um, I think we as a community need to also support um, all these, um, each other in these traumatic events that are happening in our community and to think again about, I don't know how we can support more um, control of guns um, that are available to, uh, you know, everybody that wants one. I think this is a very sad case. So again, condolences to 
the families of, of all these young men and uh, to our community. Any other comments from the council? Um, I too had some conversations with our staff and in particular with Chief Lally this week um, in light of the, the, the tragic incidents uh, this weekend. Um, as, a, as a resident, as a parent, just the, the whole, the grim reminder of the human toll that gun violence takes on our communities um, is seen right here today. Um, but I want to have Chief Lally come forward and give us an update on where things stand with the investigation. I know the community is interested in hearing what's going on. Thank you, Chief. I just want to clarify too that the, the shooting that happened this evening was not in Elgin. So that was a, a neighboring town just for clarification too. Um, that was in West Dundee. So, um, so good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, the Council Member, City Manager Kozel, and the Elgin community. So I'm here this evening to provide you with an update to the shooting incident that occurred in the early morning hours this past Sunday at the Black Hawk Apartments. And before I start, I too wish to express my condolences to the family and friends of the victims. And please know that the Elgin Police Department has been working diligently to ensure justice for your loved ones. I also want to thank community members who have come forward to provide information. And if anyone has any information that may assist, please call us at 847-289-2600. You can also remain anonymous and provide information. You can text us a tip and you can do this by sending a message to 847-411 and include Elgin PD in the beginning of the text message. Additionally, you can call a 24-hour hotline, confidential tip line at 847-695-4195. The department continues to be dedicated to solving our shooting cases, and when we can, we have made several arrests in these incidents. The shooting incidents in our community are both tragic and unacceptable. And when these incidents happen, it is a priority of the police department to ensure that all resources are utilized to make an arrest. The department remains committed to providing a safe community for everyone. And all incidents that involve gunfire are investigated by detectives using methods to include directed patrols, case analytics, canvassing of neighborhoods, video captures, and other forensic methods. We also continuously network with our local and state partners to exchange information, networking with any crime analysts from area departments to see if any of their shootings has a correlation to ours here in Elgin. These type of investigations take a significant effort on multiple fronts by the department and to preserve the integrity of the ongoing investigation into the incident that occurred on Sunday morning, any details that are surrounding the motive, evidence or witness statements will not be shared. When updates can be provided, we will absolutely ensure that our community is made aware and that these details are released at an appropriate time as not to compromise or jeopardize the investigation and any possibility of making an arrest. The information that I can share is that on Sunday at 1.59 in the morning, officers responded to the 900 block of Congdon Avenue for a reported shooting. When officers arrived on scene, they located five male adult subjects with injuries who were subsequently transported to area hospitals. We were then later notified of a six male subject who had self-transported to a local hospital. This incident occurred at a gathering. Two victims have succumbed to their injuries. Two victims remain hospitalized and two have been released from the hospital. Over the past few days, detectives, officers, and our evidence response team have continued to investigate this incident. Last night and this evening, our patrol officers, along with officers from our crime-free housing unit, our resident officer program, the Collaborative Crisis Service Unit, our Social Services Division, conducted a walk and talk in the area of the Black Hawk Apartments. <clears throat> there we spoke with residents to answer any questions that we can at this time. Tomorrow evening at six o'clock, we will also be conducting another walk and talk in the surrounding area, and again, answering any questions that we can. We have also been in contact with the neighborhood group, and we will be setting up a meeting to talk to the group as soon as possible. Additionally, we have been in contact with the property management company. And I also want to provide some context and some information 
as it relates to calls for service in the Blackhawk apartment complex. That complex is comprised of 22 total buildings, 13 which are attached to the main complex. The 22 buildings house over 350 units with an average of three people per unit, which is over 1,100 people in this condensed area. From January 2021 through March 31st, 2022, a 15-month period, in the main complex which houses the 13 buildings, one of which where the incident occurred, these 13 buildings had 607 calls for service. The top call for service that we received during this time frame, 19% of those calls were related to some type of domestic related incident. 7% were related to loud music calls, 7% related to some type of standby service, which is usually in instances where there's a domestic related matter, and 7% were for a check on the welfare. It could be anything from an elderly subject or to a missing person. So I will continue to provide the community and the council with any updates as they become available and when it's appropriate to do so. Um, I can take any questions now, again, being mindful of the ongoing investigation. Any questions from the council? Yeah, Ms. Rauschenberger. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Um, so the walk and talks you do in the neighborhood is to support the neighborhood and to help them understand what happened and that you're there and we're safe and supporting our community individuals. Correct. It's, um, it's a dual purpose. One is to provide that support because it is a traumatic and can be a traumatic incident for people. So we do have services. That's why our social service mm -hmm. division is out there, collaborative crisis service unit. But also it's to see if um, anyone has any information. So. Um, you know, if people feel more comfortable coming forward in that type of scenario, then we encourage it. But also, again, people can remain anonymous. So it's to provide the um, comfort, answer questions, mm -hmm. and then also to see if there's any information that we can get from people in the neighborhood. Okay, great. Thank you. And I appreciate that support for our community. Yes. Hi, Chief. You provided information on uh, crime stati statistics for that area. I know that I've heard in some instances there's a sense that, that's, that there's a higher incidence of crime that's occurring there. Can you provide some context on the information as it relates to the domestics and how this, how this is interpreted by the police department? Is this a problematic area is essentially what I'm asking. And looking at the crime stats, which is why we looked at the past 15 months, just to take a, a, to take a gauge of what's happening. Um, when we see that there's 19%, and again, this is reported crime, so we have to make sure that people understand that there may be incidents going on that people are not reporting to us. But when 19% um, of the incidents are related to some type of domestic uh, dispute and or domestic battery, again, 7% um, for loud music, 7% for a standby, and 7% for a check on the welfare, considering the amount of people in that neighborhood and how many people are there. And again, this was just looking at the 13 main buildings that are attached to um, the, the complex. Um, you know, in, in looking at that, this is not something that's unusual for that amount of people. And again, you know, the domestic disputes, you know, that could be anything from an argument uh, to somebody actually committing a battery. Um, so, you know, it varies. So. Um, when almost you know 20% of the calls are related to to that type of incident, um, you know it's in, in totality, um, it's not something that was concerning or that's jumping off the paper. Any other comments from the council? Yes, Councilwoman Martinez. Thank you, um, Chief Lally. I'd just like to thank you to, for clarifying that that other that shooting today was not here in Elgin. Yes. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear because I don't want people to confuse this incident with something that that there uh, it did not happen in Elgin this evening. Though I do think the young man was from Elgin. Yeah. yeah the but I just want to clarify that the yeah the shooting did not occur in Elgin. That's all I wanted to be clear about. Any other comments? Um, thank you, Chief Lally, to You're you welcome. and uh, your department for all of your work on this. I know that um, it's been a lot. I know there's a lot of hours uh, that go into this, um, and it is traumatic. It's traumatic for the, the residents who were 
awaken in the wee hours of the morning uh, by gunshots or saw uh, people who had been shot. It was, pro it was traumatic for the officers who responded to the scene and saw people who were shot. Um, and the students that uh, Councilwoman Rauschenberger mentioned that live in the complex. I lived in Black Hawk Apartments the, the very first year that I moved here in 1999. Um, and I enjoyed it. It was it was a decent place to live, and I just really believe that at some point, as a society, we have to come up with a better way for um, our young people to um, address their disputes and not be so quick to pull out a gun um, to to solve an argument or a dispute. Um, you, 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 you can't come back from that. You can come back from, you know, an argument. You can come back from, you know, a fist fight. You, a lot of times you can't come back from um, pulling out guns. And bullets don't have names. So there are a lot of potential innocent bystanders that can be affected. So um, Thanks for your diligence with this and just continued uh, prayers and condolences to the families, um, all of the families that have been affected by this tragedy. And um, we just really need to, need to think of ways that we can do better. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, announcements from staff. Nothing this evening, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, and there is one more announcement. Um, just want to announce that I did get a chance to talk to the actual mayor this week, Mayor Captain, who is at home recovering from a knee replacement surgery. He sends his best. I'm sure he's watching us. Uh, speedy recovery to you, Mayor Captain. And he told me to tell all of you that he's doing well. And it is everything that he was told that it was going to be. <laughs> so take that for, for, for what it is. I'm, I'm sure it's not comfortable, but Mayor Captain is a real trooper. So I know that, that you'll do well with your rehab, and I know that uh, your wife Sandy is going to make sure that you have all the support that you need. So take good care of yourself. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Powell? Yes. We are adjourned.